Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It is good to be here today. I'm glad I'm here. Happy birthday to Sheila. Wow. It's wonderful. She's been a wonderful, wonderful worker in this church. And thank her for all that she has done and her faithfulness to the kingdom of God. Anthony, good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. Amen. Yes, absolutely. Good to see everybody that's here this morning. Thank you for being here. Living a life of faith. That's what we're talking about. That's where we are this morning. Living a life of faith. And it is a matter of turning our life over to God and following Him, worshiping Him, loving Him. And every day is a faith walk. It is, it is never a walk without faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. You, you must have faith. You've got to believe. And fortunately for all of us, the Bible said God has dealt unto every man a measure of faith. We all have some degree of faith. We believe in something. And so our faith this morning is the thing that carries us through and the thing that gives us the courage to walk with God. I'm going to the book of Galatians chapter 3. Um, I didn't put those verses up, but Jenna can get them for me. And beginning in verse 19, I'm going to read verse 19 through 23, and I just want to share these verses with you this morning, then I want to get into my text. I love the Word of God. I've spent my life studying the book. This is, this is my life. And you know, I, uh, I just uh, was reading this week about Johnny James, our friend Johnny James that just passed. Johnny was a, I mean, Brother James was a great, great man of God. He had the entire Bible memorized. You know what, he was 90, was he 93 or 94 or something like that? And he gave the tithing of every day, which was his uh, uh, two hours and, and um, uh, the, the, the uh, two, what, two hours and 40 minutes maybe or something like that. And he said, every day of my life, I took the tithing of my time to memorizing the Bible. And even up until his last days of his life, he was still spending his two hours and 40 minutes a day memorizing the Word of God, still remembering it, still holding on to the Word of God. And we have got to have the Word of God hid in our heart, and we will not be able to survive in our walk with God unless we have the courage of the Bible to be with us and to encourage us and to strengthen us. We will not be able to make it. And so I need that word hid in my heart that I will not be a failure to God. We live in a, a stressful time in the kingdom of God. In our verses this morning, I'm going to stop and comment just a little bit through them. But the writer begins in verse 19 by asking really the question, what serves the law? What good is the law? What is the purpose of the law? Now in our day, in our religious world, it just seems to be that everybody has cast the law away. They've thrown it away. They don't want anything to do with it. And so the writer is saying, what is the purpose? What is the service of the law? And he said, it was added because of our transgression. In other words, in the beginning, there was no need for a law because God created man and put him in a perfect environment. And, but the time came that because of transgression, God had to give a law. And the law was because of transgression till the seed that should come to, the, to uh, come to whom the promise was made, and that seed was Jesus. The law did not, the law has not changed. The law has never changed. The difference that what has changed is, is that the law today is not on the table of stones, but it is in our heart. Now you read the word of God and, you know, people will say, we're not under law, we're not under law. We're under law more today than we've ever been. We're under restriction. We're under the restrictions of God. The Bible said that God has written it on the table of our heart. Now, he is saying this to me and to you, that you cannot be saved by obeying the law because the law can't do for you what needs to be done. It's going to take a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you're never going to get away from the teaching of the laws of God. They're always there. Now, verse 20. 
Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. In other words, if God, when Jesus Christ came, the seed of God, he came to mediate. Now, if there was only one, there's no such thing as a mediator. Because one can't mediate with just one. One mediates between two or more parties to try to negotiate between them and bring them an agreement. That's what Jesus did when he came into this world. He came to take your place and to represent you before God and to go to Calvary to die for your sin. That in through his death, he would be able to pay the debt for sin that heaven demanded, and that I could be set free from the power of sin. And that's what Jesus has done for every one of us. He mediated between God and man. Verse 21. The law then was, uh, uh, is then the law against the promises of God, God forbid. The law was never against the promises of God. In fact, the law was God. The Bible said in John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was made flesh, and that Word was God. That Word was God. It will never be anything less than God. If I take my Bible and I rip out from Genesis to Malachi, I have just thrown away that much of God. Because that is the total thing that personified Jesus Christ. He was the Word made flesh. He was that Word made flesh. And so... The, Jesus said when he came, he said, search the scripture in John 5, 39. Search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they that testify of me. When I took, read in the Bible about scripture, he is talking about Genesis to Malachi. He is not talking about Matthew to Revelation because that had not been written yet. The only thing that had been written was from Genesis to Malachi. And so he said, search the scripture. And what you're going to find out is that all the laws of God tell the story about me. They tell who I am, what I am. They tell my purpose and my intent of being here. And so he said, verily the righteousness should be, um, uh, I'm sorry, for if there had been a law given which could have, made, uh, could have given life, verily righteousness should have been of the law. The law could not give righteousness, it could just give restriction. But the restriction was not bad because that restriction was God. Are you with me this morning? That restriction was God, and it is still God, and it is still the teaching of God here this morning. Then in verse 23... And before faith came, before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterward be revealed. I want you to notice those words, and I'm going to, my message this morning is going to dwell around these words that I am shut up unto the faith, which afterward would be revealed. Shut up unto the faith of God. I am shut up. I am in a boundary. I am in a restricted area. I am limited to what I can do. I read a story recently of a historian that had written by the name of Tim Massey. Tim Massey was writing a story of the Civil War, and he's talking about a time in, in 1864 when it was probably one of the coldest winters ever in our region, and especially through the Tennessee region. And he tells the story of many of the uh, civil, uh, during the Civil War, the Union uh, soldiers that were freezing to death. They were dying of hypothermia. They were dying in the field because their bodies were freezing in the overnight. And the officers of the Union, uh, uh, some of the Union officers went to a farmer in, uh, in Tennessee, in Greene County, Tennessee, and they asked for permission. Can we, as our military group, can we tonight camp on your farm? They asked for permission to do that. They did not just take the right, they asked for permission to do that. The farmer gave them permission. And then the military leader, the soldiers asked them, they, he asked the, the farmer, he said, Sir, you have a large rail fence all around your yard, all around your house, and all around your animals. 
And he said, would it be possible in the frigid temperatures of tonight, could we take down the top rail of that fence and use that for firewood to keep our guys from dying of, of, of freezing overnight? And so the farmer agreed, but the farmer asked them, he said, be sure of one thing, don't take any more than the top rail. If you take the top rail, there's still enough fence that will keep all of my animals intact and in place, but don't take anything more than the top rail. So the command went down to the soldiers that they, should, uh, that they could take the top rail off of the fence and when they would take the top rail, they could cut it up and use it for firewood so they would not freeze in the overnight frigid temperature. The problem was, the first ship took the top rail. The second ship came along, and they took the top rail. And then the third ship came along, and they took the top rail. So in the morning when the farmer got up, there was no fence left. Everything had been totally destroyed and not one soldier had disobeyed the command. They had all removed nothing but the top shelf or the top uh, rail that was on the fence. One by one, they removed the fence and now the livestock was all running wild and no way to bring it into captivity again because they have lost that which had shut them in and given them protection on the farmer's land. Here this morning, I want to talk to you about biblical guardrails, fencing that God has placed for his people. We have some areas that were important to us that we might have thrown away along the way, that we might not should have thrown away. Some things that were good, some principles that were wholesome, that some things that were protection to us. When we talk about certain standards, not all the things we have been taught in the past, but a lot of standards, they were given to us for our protection. We've got to set some boundaries in our life with God. There are some areas we can't go into. There are some things we can't do. We are not free to do everything the world is free to do. We are shut up inside the perimeters of faith. Shut up by faith. We have boundaries on our life. When you get into your car and start back to your home today, some of you will drive further distances than others. Some of you will drive into town three miles. Some of you will drive to Caneyville about eight or nine miles. Others of you will drive maybe to Elizabethtown, which is 30 miles, and some to different towns. Bryson, he will drive back about 60 some miles to get home. When you get on the road to drive, you don't have the freedom, even though you have the freedom to get on the road and drive, your driver's license gives you that permission. You are not free to drive anywhere you want to and any way you want to. You have to have restrictions that are placed upon you. And the restriction that they place upon you in America is there is a line to your left that you do not go over. And then there is a, a, an edge of the pavement on the right that you don't get off of. Because if you do, number one, on the right, you may end up in a ditch. And number two, on the left, if you get over beyond that line, you are subject to a collision that may take away you or your family members or all of you. You have restrictions, guidelines that are placed upon you. What they are, they are standards. They are standards. My my place to drive is from the middle of the road to the outside of the blacktop. And so safety is supposed to be mine as long as I stay with the standard. Dangers come pressing upon me when I begin to press that a little bit. Amen. Not long ago, uh, more than likely, we, we think that someone just in our area rolled off the side of the blacktop and tried to come back on. And when they tried to come back on, they flipped the car and end up deceased in that uh, ca catastrophic uh, accident that they were in. And it happened because the borders, the, the boundaries were not respected. The boundaries were not appreciated. Let me tell you this morning, when God said to live holy, he didn't say live holy just because he was trying to put a limitation upon you. He knew the protection that you needed. 
He knew that every person, every child of God needed to be holy. That we needed to live our life in commitment and dedication to God. The gospel, the good news that we believe in and that we practice, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not given to us to bar everybody out. It's given to us to give us protection, that we can find safety inside of the teaching of God. Religious guidelines are for your protection. The church is not trying to drive people off. We're trying to bring people in. We're not trying to hurt people's feelings. We're trying to give them something that will bring them the most lasting satisfaction of peace and joy that their life has ever known before. When we talk about worship, worship is for your protection. When we talk about dedication, dedication is for your protection. When we talk about a life that is prayerful and praying and seeking the face of God, we're talking about things that will protect you. They are protection for you and for your family. What I'm talking about this morning is, is that life has to have some guardrails. We have to have some limitations. We, we can't just be free to do everything that the world out there does. All in recent uh, decades, We've seen a lot of these guidelines just kind of erode away until we no longer pay attention to what we should or should not be doing. There was a time in my life that the church was easily recognized. When you would meet people on the street, you could kind of tell what a Christian was. They were dressed modest, they looked modest, they act modest. And you knew them because they were identifiable. But today, those restrictions have all fallen away until we can't identify a child of God when we see them anymore. Church people act like the world. There's little or no separation between the church and the world. We have come to a time that Christians are happy and, and, uh, and feel comfortable to sit down as social drinkers and, and to live in the world like that. We come to a time that dressing modestly is no longer a restriction of the church, even though it is of God. And the church has come to a time that if there's ever a moment that we needed to rebuild some of these walls and put some of these old rails back in place uh, to keep the sheep from wandering and getting away to where they lose their protection, we need to rebuild some walls in the church today. Do you believe that? Come on, folks, I don't know whether you're with me today or not. Amen. But it's still the Word of God. Believers have removed boundaries one rail at a time. They didn't do it just one great big gulf or one great big jump, but little at a time. We walk into many churches today. I don't even recognize where I am. They black out the lights till you can't see to get out. If you had to go to the bathroom, you're almost afraid you'll trip over the pews. Amen. They, all lights are out. I've, I've uh, been in churches, and even recently, I'm talking about our churches, until they black out so much. I knew you had to be careful if I leaned over to talk to Sheila, it might be somebody else's wife. You didn't know who you're talking to because you couldn't see. Everything's blacked out. Listen, friend, the church is not a bar room. We're not here to have a tavern experience. We are here to worship God and to give God praise and to exalt Him. This is not a religious concert. This is a time of giving glory and honor and praise to Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a world that is filled with trouble. And if we don't get them back on track with God, we are in trouble in our nation. We have broken homes. We have drug and alcohol addiction. We have more people dying of overdosing today than ever before. We have violence in our streets. We have racial uh, 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 maliciousness and animosity today. We have national chaos everywhere that we look. And we're blaming the world all around us for the trouble that we're in. I'm here to tell you this morning, the problem is not the world. The world hasn't created the problem. It's not the world. The world has never set the standards for the world to go by. It is the fault of the church. When the church was the church, and we rose up to worship and praise and prayer and seeking God and fasting, the church influenced the world. And the world became steadily better when the church was rising into the glory of the Spirit of God. When the church was the church, we had a world that knew where to go when they felt their lives were in trouble. They knew they could find the answer in the church and they would run into the place of God. 
Amen. <coughs> when the church was the church, we were a city of refuge. We were a hope for a dying world. And I think it is time today that we stop and reconsider. Maybe we need to cut some new rails and put up some new fences and put up some new guidelines and take our stand with God and say that as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Come hell or high water, we're going to serve the Lord. Whether the devil likes it or not, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to worship him if the devil likes it. I'm going to worship him if the devil doesn't like it. I've come to this place to give him praise hallelujah hallelujah I'm going to worship him he's what it's all about it's not about me it's about the glory and the power and the anointing of Jesus hallelujah 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 the world has developed its own theories we live in a day of, of, of all kinds of situations and and there was a time the church took its stand and took its stand for issues and morality and took its stand against immorality. There was a time the church believed that homosexuality and being a lesbian was wrong. And it's not because the church believes it. That's not my doctrine. It is because we're taught that from the book of Genesis to Malachi. We're taught that in Romans 1. We're taught that in other teachings of the Bible. But many today are patting them on the back and letting it go by. I never thought the Southern Baptists and the Baptist organization, and I'm not knocking the Baptists this morning if you're one of them, but I'm telling you this, Amen. They have preachers that decided that they were born wrong. And so they went to the hospital and had a, a, a surgery. And women became men and men became women. And then they would ordain them into the ministry. Listen, folks, we need a return back to the Word of God. God wasn't confused when you were born. He knew what you were. He knew what He anticipated you to be. And we need to be what God created us to be. Amen. Give him praise in the house here this morning. But the theory of the world is they were born that way and can't help themselves. What if the world decided to use the same theory and say God created a murderer and he was born that way and he can't help it so he should be accepted into our society. That wouldn't go over very good with it, Anthony. No, that wouldn't fit very good. What about if he's a pedophile? And we say, well, he abuses kids, but he was born that way. He can't help himself because he was born that way, so we should accept him as he is. Or the thief that you can't lay anything down in your yard or in your church or anywhere else because the thief is going to pick it up and carry it off. And the list is endless. It just goes on and on and on. Let me tell you, sin is a choice. Rebellion against God is a choice. Perversion is a choice you got to decide that it is not the position you were born with it is a choice that you make for your life and God will hold you responsible for the choices you make I came this morning to preach Amen. I didn't come try to pat you on the back or pacify you or try to make you feel good I come to tell you if you heaven and live for God, you better get in the book and see what God is expecting and make your life dedicated and committed and surrender to God because nothing is going there but the pure in heart. Jesus said that and I'm going to go with him. We need to have some godly boundaries. Our nature is to resist boundaries. <coughs> we by nature don't like brown boundaries. We don't like restriction. Our carnal nature We'll protest against restriction. We demand freedom. We want freedom. Life has, uh, we want life with, with no boundaries, no biblical boundaries. Let me tell you something. When biblical boundaries are not enforced in the church, then it's not going to affect the righteousness of the world. They will never have a change until they, until they see it in the body of believers. Where there are no restrictions and no boundaries, it is not freedom, it's lawlessness, it's disorder. It's disrespect. It is turning our heart against God. The train goes down these tracks, but none of them go anywhere without tracks 
to follow on. If you take a, 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 a we, if we don't have limitation, we'll be like a kite that's flying in the air without a string attached. You know what will happen? If you, the moment you cut that string or the string uh, detaches, that old kite up there will start flipping and flopping and it won't be but a little while till it'll take its dive and it'll take its fall because the thing that holds it in the air is restrictions and limitations. That restriction of the string makes it fly. That's what puts it up there. It is that great 747 that flies in the air. It is the restriction of the lift underneath the wing that lifts it up and makes it fly. I'm here to tell you this morning that we cannot lose our restrictions, our limitations, our holiness, our righteous living. God's people have to live right. Boundaries are for our protection. Almighty God has established boundaries and boundaries are for our protection. God says to you kids, thank God for all these kids around here. After a little bit, they start moving around and squirming and talking. But you know what? We've been talking at home. I'd a whole lot rather hear them talk a little bit than to hear silence in the church where there are none. I'd rather see these babies sitting on these seats. Thank God for all these beautiful little boys and girls that are sitting here this morning. I'm thankful for you. Boundaries are for your protection. But God says to you, respect your parents. Give honor to your parents. Yet today, children are rising up, killing parents and grandparents all over our nation as though it is absolutely nothing. Parents receiving little respect from, from their uh, children today. Very little respect. And the parents are doing all they can do. They're suffering and striving and the parents are wearing rags while they're trying to buy their kids the best thing that they can show them in, in the school. But the kids aren't respecting it. Grandparents are like a forgotten generation that's fallen off of the globe. Let me tell you, Children have to respect their parents. If not, you don't have a guarantee of a long life because it is the only promise in the Word of God that has longevity attached to it. Honor your father and mother and your days shall be long upon the earth. Respect those who brought you into the world and the generations before them. Hallelujah. God tells us to tell the truth. Yet we've come to a time that we think half-truth is good enough. Half-truth never good enough. Half-truth is not truth at all. Half-truth is an outright lie. We've got to not try to fall into a half-truth situation. God says, love your neighbors. And it is our intuitive nature to try to, restri or to, to rebel and to re uh, restrictions. We resist that. We don't want restrictions. We want to be set free. Respecting God's rules is a blueprint to a good life. If you want a good life, follow God's ways. You want a good life with your family? Follow God's, uh, God's ways. Amen. The Bible said, if, if the Son hath set you free, you are free indeed. When Jesus came into your life, you found freedom. Thank God for that freedom. Now, I can look at myself and say, I just can't help this sin. Yes, you can. The Bible said Jesus came to make you free. And if you can't be set free, then Jesus lied. And the Bible said it is not possible for him to lie. It is his immutable promise. It is unchangeable promise that God cannot lie. I'm here to tell you this morning that God is looking for us to live, to step up and to live our life with commitment and dedication and holiness to God we need to surrender our total life to Jesus do you believe that this morning give him praise in the house hallelujah hallelujah there are times then we're without sufficient guardrails and oh God I need your guardrails I, I need something to protect me because if not I wander like the sheep to the field and I, I wander out with, away from your protection and I don't want to do that. I want to be free. Years ago, years ago, there was not an issue to the right and wrongness of abortion. But then along came the Roland Wade situation. 
and the law changed. Recently, as you know, our Supreme Court has made the decision to overrule that and to throw it into the government of the state. Most states have not made abortion in circumstances or situations wrong. If it is the life of the child or the life of the mother, or if it is incest, or if it is a rape situation. I, I'm going to tell you, you don't know, it's easy to call those shots when you haven't been there. It's easier to call those shots. See, I remember when my daughter contacted me and said, I don't know how to tell you this, so I'm going to put it in a letter form. I am pregnant. She was, I think, a freshman in high school. And she said, I am, I am pregnant and I don't know what to do about that. And she said, second thing I want to tell you, and I'm, I'm sorry to be able to have to tell you this, but when it is born, he's going to be black. And she's, see, I didn't want my 16-year-old daughter out of school. I didn't want my 16-year-old daughter carrying around a baby on her hip. I wanted her to enjoy some years of her life. I didn't want that. And she said, Dad, if you'll just tell me, I'll have an abortion. Let me tell you something. For me to tell you that it didn't run through my mind, I would be a liar. But when I stopped and I thought about it, I said to her, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed that you at 16 years old are going to make your life with such restriction and that you're going to lock down to a newborn baby. I, I'm, I'm disappointed but we're going to love it and we're going to help raise it and we're going to do everything we can to make it as well as we can and we did we did when Byron was born he lived in Louisville but we had him 180 days a year they had him 185 we had him 180 Sheila would pick him up every Friday take him home on Monday morning in time for school, every holiday, every break, every day that was not in school, he was here. <coughs> Byron brought so much joy and satisfaction to our life that we were hating it when they wasn't twins. Now, was I in favor of the wrong of having that child out of, childbirth, out of wedlock? No. I was disappointed. Was I embarrassed? Yes, I was. I was very embarrassed. But never entered my mind that I had any less responsibility than to love him, to care for him, to be there for him. And I can see him now. Breaks my heart. I never, I never get to see Byron anymore. He says he's busy. I don't know what busy means. Busy means I don't want anything to do with you right now. But hopefully that'll change someday. Sheila would bring him in on Friday night and our stair stairs came up to the sunroom like this. And he'd peek around that wall. And I'd always act like I was asleep so I'd, he'd, he'd just stand there and watch and watch, see if I was going to move. And the minute I moved... Here he'd come, jump right up in my lap. Never thought about it anymore that she was just 16. Never thought about it anymore that, that he was anything less in color than I was. We were just family. That's all we were. <coughs> so 
So the Supreme Court said they're going to reverse that decision. And the reaction has been an outrage. Because our society decided that abortion was a means to be freed from promiscuity. It was never intended to be that. It was never intended for people to get out and live any way they wanted to live. That was not the intent of it. It was the intent that it be in areas of, of need or mandatory of some reason. I'm probably into that deeper than I need to be with no more time than I've got left. But I can come back next week and finish. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you this morning this. Because the Supreme Court said years ago it was okay, that's not what the book said. And because our government says it's okay, that's not what the book, our, as much as I love America, as much as I love our government, listen to me, friend, they are not God and they did not write the conditions of the Bible and God knows more what you need than anybody in this world knows. Follow God and let Him lead you where you need to go. Hallelujah. As every head is bowed in this building this morning and every mind is upon God, I'm asking you to consider who you are, where you are, and what your needs are, and to turn your faith over to Jesus this morning. And you can come to this altar and bow your knee before the presence of God and you can begin to talk to the Lord. God, I'm sorry for the years that I've wasted. I'm sorry for the years that are behind me. And from this day forward, I'm starting a new life with a new journey. And I'm going to follow you. I'm going to come to know you. Or maybe you're here this morning would just like to kind of renew your relationship. And I'm, at, I'm inviting you right now, right where you're set, to stand up and to come down to this altar while people's heads are bowed and their eyes are closed and, and they're worshiping God. But I'm asking you, does it matter if, if you're part of the praise team, if you're part of the, of the church board or who you are, there's always room at the altar. Would you come? <coughs> Would you come? Anybody? Just turn it over to Jesus. Right now, no more. Just two ladies. Come here with Denise. Come on, right now, two ladies. Now we're waiting to see if someone else is coming. Somebody else. There's others in this building here this morning. That this is a season of prayer. This is a time of commitment. This is a time of dedication to God. Come on, let's step out and come. If you're here this morning and you want to pray and you feel that need to turn it over to Jesus, come on, right now is your time. Okay, let's find a lady with each one of these. And these little girls need somebody with them praying. Come on. Are there others here this morning? Oh, yes. I'm going to ask everybody in the building to come. And let's just come around this front and let's pray. And let's talk to God. Come on, let's.